Um, all right. Yeah. So thank you very much for coming in. And also thanks to the organizers for having me speak here. Um, so today I'll be, uh, I'll be talking about how we can build primordial fluctuations using anisotropies and stochastic gravitational backgrounds. Um, and this will mostly be based on this work, the um, direct collaboration of John Syndrome and Yushan Sai, which appeared last year. And towards the very end, I, I, I might briefly mention about another work in progress um, with Yamasui following from the Okay, so, um, so since we are here, um, all of us are excited about gravitational waves and famously back in 2015, LIGO discovered this binary black hole merger with this very um, uh, interesting waveforms. And since then, we have discovered many, many more mergers in involving neutron stars as well. So this has become a very vibrant field of research. But today I'll be uh, thinking about stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds um, and what that basically means in the context of these astrophysical mergers is that along with these mergers that you can resolve, there is typically an expectation that you're going to have mergers very, very far away from us. So we are not going to resolve these individual waveforms, but rather all these waveforms, they will just overlap on top of each other with some random temporal phase to effectively give rise to a noise pattern in your detector. So in spirit, what you'll see is, is this random noise coming towards you from all directions across the sky. And that's like the stochastic gravitational backgrounds that we have been curating about. So uh, we'll, we'll draw a lot of analogy uh, with the CMB because a lot of methodology and concepts you can apply in this context. So we'll see that as, as you go. So what's very exciting is that uh, the LIGO Virgo camera collaborations, they're already been searching for these stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds. And the, uh, the spectral energy density in, in these backgrounds, um, the normalization of that is somewhat uncertain, but there's some expectation of what frequency dependence this spectral energy density would follow. So given this, this sort of templates, um, uh, there is an upper bound on the amount of energy density we can have in gravitational waves. For example, if you are at 25 hertz, this is the upper limit. And for other frequencies, I'm showing this plot from their paper, where this dashed uh, blue line, it gives you the upper bound as a function of frequency. So uh, what's very exciting is that uh, although this normalization is somewhat uncertain, it is possible that uh, with, the, with the upgrades, this background coming from binary neutron star or binary black hole mergers can actually be detectable in the near future. So we'll see how that goes. But if it is detectable here, you can use this frequency dependence to extrapolate this at these frequencies. And that would be a very interesting cross check of, um, of these backgrounds. So this is all about the homogeneous piece um, of the of these backgrounds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you're asking about the frequency. Yeah. yeah, so um, so they do, yeah, I mean, there is some uncertainty in it, uh, but this particular one assumes is that as these mergers are happening, they are doing effectively a circular orbit, so the eccentric eccentricities are assumed to be very small. And with that kind of assumption, you, you get you get this frequency dependence. And I guess, yeah, there is also some assumption about the star formation. Yeah. But they, they do consider some other frequency dependencies as well. OK, so, um, so along with these uh, monopole searches, they're, they're also been searching uh, for anisotropies. And the point here is that um, these astrophysical backgrounds, they're a bias tracer of the matter perturbation. In other words, if you, if you see more matter um, along certain directions in the sky, you typically expect to have more mergers there and you can expect to have more gravitational wave coming towards you. So, uh, so once again, like they have, they, have, uh, they have put in upper bounds on the, on the CLs, where CLs are somewhat analogous to the CLs we use in the context of CMB. So they have put upper bounds on the strength of anisotropies as a function of multiple moments. And once again, focusing on the on this particular spectral dependence, you see that they are already putting they are already putting constraints um, up to like L sub four or so. So this is of course like very very small compared to the uh, typical CMB multiple moments that we think about. But uh, in the future, this is going to 
Okay, so uh, so this was all about astrophysics, and this is just to give you a sense that astrophysical backgrounds and their nature properties on, on top of that, they are they are an interesting physics candidate. And I mean the collaborations, they are going to keep searching for this in the future. But then in this talk, I'll be focusing on cosmological backgrounds and ask what kind of particle physics or early universe cosmology we can learn from it by studying such stochastic gravitational backgrounds and anisotropies on top of that. So we have already been hearing about that uh, there exist quite a few classes of particle physics or early universe scenarios that can give you large stochastic gravitational backgrounds from a cosmological perspective, including phase transitions or strings, um, uh, inflation, preheating, and, and, and things like this. So in particular, what I will be thinking about is, uh, is our, our, our phase transitions. And I'll, I'll then argue that in, a, in that context, you generically expect to have uh, significant anisotropies and which can actually be observable. And, and then I'll ask, if you see such anisotropies, then what can you learn from such a gravitational wave background? So here, an interesting fact is that gravitational waves, they're pretty much free stream, right? They do not interact after getting generated. So if there are the phase transition at very early uh, universe at very high temperatures, what these kind of maps would do, it, it would basically preserve the, uh, it would basically take a snapshot of the perturbations in the universe, and then it will basically propagate it all the way towards us. So in that sense, these maps, they preserve very, very pristine primordial information uh, about the universe. So, and also another important thing is that because you're thinking about some phase transition, very likely there is some new physics at play. So it is totally possible that this map of stochastic gravitational background that you'll get, it is independent from the CMB. So you, we can hope to learn totally new sort of information by studying such maps and anisotropies on so this is the broad question. So this is this is the question we're going to ask, and uh, we are we are going to focus on one particular scenario to to show how these maps are going to be uh, very very complementary to the same. So first, I'll I'll quickly talk about how phase transitions can give rise to such anisotropies, and then I'll talk about how you can use these maps to probe primordial non-gaussianity, and then I'll focus on a scenario where these probes are. Uh, are much, much more powerful compared to the standard probes of non gaussianity using CMB and large scale structure. And then I'll conclude. So, okay, so we have already heard a lot about phase transitions um, in the earlier uh, part of this workshop. So, just to set some notation here, so what I will be thinking about are uh, bubble collision generated gravitational waves from phase transitions. Uh, this is just a simplifying choice. Uh, of course, sound waves and turbulence, they they would give rise to, they would also give rise to important contributions to the gravitational waves. But just for simplicity, I'll focus on bubble collisions. And um, we have also seen like these phase transition parameters. Uh, there are these two parameters, alphas and betas, that determine the peak, peak amplitude and the peak frequency. Okay, good. So, so now we want to argue that uh, in the context of these phase transitions, gravitational wave backgrounds, they expect to carry anisotropies. So to, to understand that, it's useful to take a step back and ask, uh, why do we see anisotropies on the CMB? And the point is that in like the inflationary phase, it plays a super crucial role here. The point is inflation generates very, very large scale super horizon perturbations, which exit the horizon and remain frozen. Horizon, but the super horizon perturbations, what that means is that every Hubble patch of the universe, they undergo like the exact same history, but there is some time here. So if you are looking at the sky, there are some patches where recombination happens earlier compared to some other and so on. So just to illustrate that, let me draw this pattern here. So let's imagine that we have an observer here. And then I'm drawing this uh, circle um in orange which is a constant redshift surface what inflation does is that it generates this super horizon perturbation and that basically means that a constant temperature surface it need not necessarily overlap or coincide with this constant redshift surface in other words what could happen is that if you for example look at here 
what it implies, what this constant temperature surface implies is that recombination happened much later compared to the average. And therefore, the, when you get the photons out of here, they have had less of a redshift coming towards you. And as a result, the photons you get, they are hotter than average. On the other hand, if you look at here, recombination again happens, of course, but then there is just more time that passes for the photon to get to you. And as a result, there is more redshift and the photons appear more. Okay. So, so just to summarize the existence of these large, large scale superhorizon perturbations, they mean that you would see anisotropies on the CMP sky. And of course, we have seen that and we have extracted a lot of cosmological information from there. Now, the point is in the context of phase transitions, you can play the exact same game, um, except for protons and electrons recombining, you have bubble collisions happening on a microscopic scale, but that those scales are super, super small. So that, so exactly what is happening at microscopic scales are not important, precisely in the same sense of what was happening for when like individual atoms were being formed. But again, just as before, if you imagine that phase transition is happening in some sector, and if that sector has uh, this large scale density perturbations generated during inflation, once again, you will be, you'll be with a scenario in which your constant redshift surface won't coincide with the constant temperature surface, which also is the phase transition surface in this case. So in other words, along some directions on the sky, the phase transition would be happening later compared to average. And as a result, gravitational waves would redshift less compared to some other directions where it will happen earlier and therefore the gravitational waves would be redshifted. So once again, just like the case of CMB, if you have such a stochastic gravitational background map, you would expect to see anisotropies on top of it, just because there were these inflationary generated, inflation generated superhorizon perturbations. All right, so once you have such a map, uh, you can quantify the anisotropies on top of this, on, on, on that map using a procedure very similar to the CMB. So you can just construct this density contrast observable, which is delta rho over rho, where rho is the energy density in gravitational waves. Uh, in practice, this basically means that you, you basically like, you have some pixels and you are basically subtracting away the sky average quantity and you're con you are forming this, um, this contrast value. Okay, so once you have this, you can, uh, as is standard, like you can analyze this on the in, in momentum space in, in terms of multiple moments. And just like the CMB, you can define some CLs uh, to characterize how much anisotropy there is. Okay, so once again, like very similar to the CMB, if you have a scale invariant spectrum, in other words, if you have scale invariant perturbations in the field that give rise to phase transitions, the CLs are expected to follow this behavior. What this physically means is that if you wanted to probe anisotropies at scales corresponding to, at angular scales corresponding to one over L, where L is the multiple moment of interest, then at that scale, the anisotropies are going to get suppressed by this factor of L. So this is just a statement that as you raise higher, as you go to higher and higher L, there are just many, many more modes that are coming in and individual, individual contributions should be suppressed, otherwise you won't get the scale invariant spectrum. But this has a very important implication as to how far in L you can go because the, the anisotropy is there falling with it. So let's, let's take, a, take a look at some of the benchmarks. So once again, I'll be focusing on this bubble generated by patient waves and there is this, um, this falling with L, one over L, so just to give you some sense, so we have the standard perturbation. Um, so typically we say it's one part in 10 to the five in the context of CMB, but this is just a energy density contrast observable. So there are some factors coming in because um, you're, you're thinking about uh, ratios of energy densities, not temperature. So this is like, just to give you some sense, this is the standard fluctuation. And then on top of that, you have this. All right. So with Lisa, if you assume, for example, uh, this sort of betas uh, for a phase transition and this sort of alphas, um, and then if you go through the numbers here, if you, you notice that uh, at Lisa, you would be able to probe 
uh, not a lot of multiples, but maybe else up to order 10 or so. But then if you have uh, this idea or video, then for somewhat different benchmarks so with even larger betas, you can actually get to uh, you can actually get to much more, much, uh, much uh, like a larger number of multiple. So, so just to summarize here, uh, I, have, I have tried to show that anisotropies are expected in these phase transition generators gravitational backgrounds, and with future detectors, you can you can get to multiple mold, multiple moments of of this order, with which you can try to prove these anisotropies. Okay, so so given that, let's now ask. Uh, how much we can learn with these kind of numbers. And in this context, uh, I'll, I'll focus on uh, how these gravitational wave backgrounds can be used to probe primordial longevity. And here I'll, I'll just construct this observable F to characterize uh, longevity. This is a very standard observable where you are, you are computing the three point function of primordial curvature perturbations. And, and you, you're normalizing it with uh, two factors of power spectrum along with some perturbations. So, uh, so this is how we can characterize non gaussianity in terms of zeta. But then just by following the same logic, you can also characterize non gaussianity of a CMD background using an observable like this. So here, what I'm doing is I'm focusing on very, very large scales, just, uh, just a simple choice, and I'm writing the Photon perturbations in terms of this curvature perturbation. And I'm basically following this definition to recast, uh, to, to rewrite this CMB observable in terms of only that again. Uh, and then you can play a very similar game with gravitational waves as well. Uh, so here again, you can go through the computation and rewrite delta rho over rho in GW in terms of this primordial curvature perturbation, and you can construct the similar observable. Now, one important point here is that how far in gravitational wave non gaussianity or on non gaussianity of these backgrounds, how much you can probe, strongly depends on how many modes you can access because the precision would, would basically go as one over root n. So if you if you are sensitive to um, L max many modes, then the precision with which this FGW parameter can be measured is, is given by this. This factor of 1034 is just due to a convention because there is one extra factor of the GW in this definition. Okay, so now let me let me talk about the scenario in which these uh, the stochastic gravitational backgrounds would be a leading probe in probing such non gaussianities And before doing that, let me first tell you like what would happen if you have like a single field inflation or single clock inflation. In that case, all the perturbations would be correlated with each other, and you can relate the, you know, the delta GW with delta gamma. And what that implies is that if you were to probe new, if you were to go to new parameter space using gravitational wave backgrounds, then by looking at this uh, this precision equation, which which I was talking about here you'd notice that you have to work very hard and it might actually be impossible. The point is, based on CMB observations, we know that this FNL parameter or FCMB parameter should be order 10 or maybe slightly bigger depending on the shapes. So if you were to go to these kind of values, it would basically imply that you have to go, you have to at least have 10 to the three number of modes or something like that. This is just a statement that at CM, using CMB, we already can probe to L max of 10 to the 3. But that is difficult because I, I told you, like, even with PVO or DeSigo, it's hard to, hard to go beyond L max of 100 using reasonable benchmarks. So this is difficult. However, um, phase transition is happening. In a, I mean, we, we do know that we typically need some additional ingredients for these phase transitions to happen. And it's very likely, or it is very plausible, that phase transition is happening in a sector that was reheated independently of the uh, independently of the standard model. Sorry. So, in other words, if the phase transition uh, sector gets its own quantum fluctuations during inflation, you are going to have some isocurvature in it. And in that case, this relation breaks down just because you have two independent quantum fluctuations that contribute to gravitational waves and photons kind of separately. 
So once you break this relation, it's very easy to avoid the non gaussianity bound from CMB that I was just talking about. So I won't be going over too much detail, but just schematically, um, what we are imagining that is that there is the inflata and there is an extra uh, sector sigma, which is very, very non Gaussian. Whereas inflaton decays into uh, something that is Gaussian, this thing, uh, it like the phase transition takes place in the sigma reheated sector. And as a result, the gravitational waves that you get, they preserve the highly non Gaussian aspects of this field. So once you go through the computation, you can relate delta GW and delta gamma in terms of uh, the gauge invariant perturbations of the inflaton and the isocurvature perturbations of the sigma field. The crucial point here is that because gravitational waves are, are generated in the sigma sector itself, they're basically a linear combination of zeta phi and S sigma. Uh, it is still sensitive to zeta phi just because of Doppler effect. On the other hand, um, photons, they do not feel this phase transition directly. They only feel it gravitationally. So therefore, the photon perturbations, while they are order one sensitive to zeta phi, they are sensitive to S sigma with a suppression factor that tells you how small energy density there was in the sector compared to the total energy value. Okay, so this is just a gravitational suppression in some sense. But then once, if you, if you now compute FCMB and FGW, you'd notice that um, because of this suppression factor, when you take like the three point function of delta gamma, you are going to get a factor which is like FBSM cubed. On the other hand, this suppression is not there in the gravitational wave case just because transition is happening in that sector itself. So long story short, uh, the CMB non gaussianities would be suppressed compared to gravitational wave non gaussianity by this factor. And by choosing FBSM of like 0.1 or so, you can easily evade the same bounds. So let me just end with this uh, money plot here, where I am I'm, uh, I'm plotting the gravitational wave non gaussianity as a function of FBSM. And as expected, if FBSM is kind of large, then the secondary effect is still important, and you would be you would be ruled like things would, the parameter space would be ruled out based on existing CMB non gaussianity searches. But then if you go to smart FBSMs, like everything is still observable. It's just that CMB or LSS is not at all sensitive to it just because of this suppression. So it is in these regions of parameter space where gravitational wave non gaussian or the gravitational backgrounds would be the, the single most important probe to probe such hidden non gaussian centers. Um, so with that, um, I, I'll be skipping over the details of this non gaussian sector, but I'm happy to, happy to answer any question if you have if you have some. But with that, I'll conclude just to just long story short, anisotropies are very, very much expected in the context of phase transitions. And with that, we can learn about hidden sectors and their non-Gaussian and non-Gaussian properties pretty well, which is complementary to the CMB analysis. So, so yeah, with that, I'll conclude. Thanks for your attention.